In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, whose never failing providence ordereth all things, both in heaven and earth, we humbly beseech thee to put away from us all hurtful things, and to give us those things which be profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. All right. So that was a prayer, like you heard, it was a prayer to have all things hurtful taken away from us, and to give us all those things that are profitable. And the important thing to recognize about that prayer is that the things that are profitable are the things that God says are profitable, and the things that are harmful are the things that God says are harmful, even though we might not understand them to be, right? Where the rich man's, um, when the rich man and Lazarus, for all of his first article gifts, blessings or curses? What's that? For the rich man. Were they blessings or curses? For the rich man and Lazarus, all his first article gifts. His purple robes, his feasting sumptuously, were those blessings or curses for him? Those were curses, right? It would have been good if God would have stripped those things from him because they were harmful to him, right? Because he could not uh, receive them rightly and recognize the giver behind the gift, okay? Um, so let's see. So we will do the song school style. Um, this is Rise Again, You Lion Hearted. So, <clears throat> let's see. It's, I'm just going to sing the first line, then you sing it back. Rise again, ye lion hearted, saints of early Christendom. Rise again, ye lion hearted, saints of early Christendom. Whither is your strength departed? Whither gone your martyrdom? Whither is your strength departed? Whither gone your martyrdom? Low love's light, oh, low love's light is on them. Glory's flame upon them. Low love's light is on them. Glory's flame upon them. And their will to die doth quell. Even the Lord and Prince of Hell. And they will to die doth quell. Even the Lord and Prince of Hell. Amen. We won't do all four verses. But let me read them to you. <clears throat> These the men, by fear unshaken, facing danger dauntlessly. These no witching lust hath taken, lust that lures to vanity. Mid the roar and rattle of tumultuous battle, in desire they soar above all that earth would have them love. Great of heart they know no turning, honor gold they laugh to scorn. Quench desires within them burning, by no earthly passion torn. Mid the lions roaring, songs of praise outpouring, joyously they take their stand on the arena's bloody sand. Would to God that I might even, as the martyred saints of old, with the helping hand of heaven, steadfast stand in battle bold. O oh my God, I pray thee, in the combat stay me. Grant that I may ever be loyal, staunch, and true to thee. Amen. Uh, so a wonderful battle cry for Christian faithful in the godless world. Um, we left off on page 19. Since this is our last session, um, I, what I'm going to try to do is I've introduced the doctrine, I've defined the doctrine, and we'll give it a final definition right here. And we've started to defend and describe this doctrine of providence. And so for this last part, really what I'd like to do is apply this doctrine to our lives as Christians, to the way in which we think, the way in which we live, move, and have our being in God, in Christ, who all, within whom all things consist. Okay? So if you look on page 19 where we left off, I have some Bible verses referencing God's providence, His preserving and governing power over all of creation. And his concurrence as well. And I just want to give you a really nice uh, definition that from the New Dictionary of Theology right there in the middle of the page. 
Providence is the beneficent outworking of God's sovereignty, whereby all events are directed and disposed to bring about those purposes of glory and good for which the universe was made. These events include the actions of free agents, those are moral beings, angels and people, which while remaining free, that is, we do have free will <coughs> so far as we can make decisions, we can't convert ourselves, that's not what it's talking about, but we do have wills, even if they're depraved, which while remaining free, personal and responsible, are also intended actions of those agents. Providence thus encompasses both natural and personal events, setting them alike within the purposes of God. And one other definition from J.I. Packer here. Providence is the unceasing activity of the Creator, whereby in overflowing bounty and goodwill, He upholds His creatures in ordered existence, guides and governs all events, circumstances, and free acts of angels and men, and directs everything to its appointed goal for its own for his own glory. Um, don't, don't worry about the Luther on Providence page. Um, surprisingly, this is just a note. Um, there, there is not much uh, in Lutheran literature, at least in English, about the doctrine of Providence. Um, the first article talks about all the aspects of that. Divine concurrence, uh, preservation, government, all of that, and that it's all, all, that's, all this God does only out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy. So there's justification. That's the relationship there. So you see all of it in Luther's explanation of the small catechism, and you also see it in the large catechism as well. Um, and if you turn the page, the main place that we see Luther talk about providence really explicitly is Genesis chapter 2. Uh, in his lectures on Genesis, and you can read that on, in your own time. But he talks about preservation of government. I underlined it like five times. Uh, one of the things that is happening within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, especially under men like uh, Benjamin Mays at the Fort Wayne Seminary, is he has been moving to uh, translate all of the Lutheran works that are in Latin and German into English. And so we're getting tons and tons of rich Lutheran theology from the age of high orthodoxy. It's not all, we have not received it all into our hands yet. We're still waiting. We're starting a college, a, a classical college, so we can get lots of Latinists to make it happen more quickly. Okay? Um, but one of those uh, works is the com Theological Commonplaces of Johann Gerhard. And he actually has an entire book like this, Commonplace, on Divine Providence, which has yet to be translated. And so, what, you, I, what I promise you will see in the next few years, even though there isn't much literature now, uh, you're going to see a lot of literature on this as stuff moves from Latin and German into English. A lot more popular volumes within Lutheranism on Providence. Okay? Um, but what you do have within the English-speaking world is really the Puritans. The Puritans are the uh, main ones where we already have them in English, and they're, they're already written, they're already available for reading. Um, but anyway, you have to wait for that. You have to be patient. The only providence you can get is just from me, all right? Um, or you can learn Latin. What's that? Or you can learn Latin. Or you can learn Latin. I encourage everyone to learn Latin. Go ahead. Who is the editor of the New Dictionary of Theology? Uh, I think it's IBP. I think that's right, yeah. The reason why I ask is the statement that all events are directed and disposed to bring about those purposes of glory and good, which to me now I may I may brought baggage into the statement, but it sounds like theology of glory. Oh, okay. I you know, I, I, if I, if I have a down here. So it's just speaking of God's glory, right? That all things are done to the glory of God. Yeah, I, I may have just, when I was typing it out, copying it out, I may have left out his. Yeah, thank you for checking. I'm not talking, yeah, no theology of glory sort of stuff. No, I missed it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so... Go to page 22, and let's see if we can get into a bit of the practicalities. 
um, of providence, its application to our day-to-day -day life as Christians. Um, so in this demonic double-ditching uh, section on page 22, um, what I want, want you to think about here is this, this is dealing with the impact that you let the doctrine of divine providence have over your day-to-day -day thinking and the way that you live your life. Okay? I would guess that for the most part, uh, most of us live functionally most of the time as atheists. And what I mean there is that we don't not believe in God or we aren't Christians, but we have very little sense of God's presence, His undergirding, pres preserving presence in the midst of every circumstance. That His, his preserving hand and His governing hand are at all times with us in everything that happens around us. And so we do just think of things as very random. Um, we do think of them as inconveniences when really we ought to perhaps step back when we think about inconveniences or things that get in our way and in, in front of our priorities and perhaps consider um, that if God allowed it, at least, into my circumstance in life, well, maybe I should be a bit more patient with it because God in his goodness saw fit to let it into my life, whatever it might be, okay? So what I'm talking about here is very, very practical. I'm talking about when you have seven children and you have to go somewhere and you have 14 shoes to find to put on feet and you find seven shoes, but it's only one of each of the seven pairs, okay? Um, you look at that and you say, okay, this is simply stupid. I can't believe this is happening again. And I'm going to lose my patience how many times we told you to put your shoes in your shoe box. Okay? But perhaps um, you ought to think about that in a different way and exercise patience. <laughs> perhaps um, the Lord is seeking to teach you something, not that you know what that is. Okay? And this is what we'll have to talk about. It's where people try to discern God's providence, where people get in big, big trouble. But what I'm saying is that if God allowed that into your life, you just call him down. Because as insane as it is, God's actually going to work all those things together for good, for the sake of your conformity to Jesus Christ, here in time, for your eternal salvation. That's those are the only... You realize those are the only two things that God can ever do in your life, okay? That God can only conform you more closely to the, to the image of Christ in this life or prepare you for eternity to be better prepared for it, okay? Those are the only th two things that God can do for you in this life. And providence uh, is the expression of that, and it's unbelievable to human reason. Um, so what I, what I do want to do as we talk about demonic double ditching, is I do want to make the awareness, I do want you to bring the awareness of God's providence over everything in your life much more into your mind than it perhaps was before this, before we taught on this. Um, God's conforming you more, your mind more to the way he actually acts rather than things just being inconveniences, chance, random luck, you know, things like that. Um, but at the same time, I do not want you to take the recognition of providence and God's preserving and governing of your life so far that you try to start to interpret it uh, in a wrong, in a sinful way. Okay. Um, and so there are really two ditches that we can that you can fall into. I, the ditch I want to get you out of right away is you need to stop thinking that anything in life is random. That needs to end. Right. Now, secondarily, though, uh, turn to page 23 of your handout. Um, this is the enthusiast and his symbols. Okay? This is making fun of uh, a, a de devil-worshipping analytical psychologist named Carl Jung, who wrote a book, Man and His Symbols. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is that you as a human being 
have been given the capacity to uh, interpret, the, give interpretation to things, right? You can interpret events in your life it, to one into one sense or another, right? God even does this in the Bible where he interprets uh, certain things in the world and helps you see a fuller reality of what's going on. For instance, okay, why, when, if I was to ask you the question, why did God make honey sweet? How would you answer that question? Why did God make honey sweet? Because he loves us. Okay, because he loves us? Sure, that's a good answer. I like it. So that we would think of scripture. Okay, do you hear what he said? So that we would think of scripture and the scripture's truth that thy word is what? Sweeter than honey. So every time you taste the sweetness of honey, God is actually proclaiming to you how much more you ought to be interested in consuming and eating the word. Okay? So God interprets reality for us. And so that would be a right interpretation. Every time you dig into a Krispy Kreme donut and you say, this thing is as good as it gets as far as sweets go. No, sorry. There's something sweeter. It's called God's word. You should be hungering for that more than you're hungering for the Boston Creek. Okay? That's a, that's a correct biblical interpretation. Okay? But, okay, what we do, because we have this capacity to interpret events and apply meaning to things, is we will not look to the scriptures to interpret events in our lives, but we will look within. We will decide that based on this series of events that's happened in my life, God is saying this or that particular thing to me. Okay. Can you say that? Can you as a Christian say that? You, you have a certain string of events that you sort of tie together in your mind, and you see a flow to it, a sort of a beginning and end to it, sort of the way God has worked through it, and you decide to give the interpretation of those events. Are you? Do you have the authority to do that? Okay. No. You do not. Um, if you... Um, if you're particularly given to um, conspiracy theories, and you're very good at int intuiting things, intuition, right? Um, you're going to be very. This is going to be a temptation for you, um, because you're going to see events in your life, things that have happened, and you're going to say this is the end of those string of events, and then give it an interpretation and application to your life. Okay? You can't do that. So what the enthusiast does, that the idea of enthusiasm is that you hear God speak to you apart from his word. Okay? Um, and I will say, God does speak to you through providence, but do you know what he's saying to you? You don't know. In those in particular circumstances and a series of events, you do not know what God is saying to you, even though you know God is actually saying something to you. Right? Um, so... I, so look at this picture. Anyone ever played that game? Rickles? If you've never played Rickles, you're just a bad person and you should go play Rickles. Okay? Um, but what, what I want you to think about here, so the little ball, see that little ball there that's you? The little ball gets hit back up into those bricks and you move around those, that, thing, that little thing in the bottom and keep hitting it back up into the bricks. Okay? Okay? Um, and... What you'll be tempted to do when you get into those little providences in life, when you come into these events that you want to interpret, um, you, the, what the, when you hit the providence, you'll want to stay there and sort of think about what it means to you, right, out of your own thoughts and feelings. You'll try to interpret it. But where the providence always sends you back to is where? It sends you back to the Holy Scriptures. Okay? You go back to the Holy Scriptures. You don't try to interpret uh, the, the events. And so, you know, uh, sometimes it, the Bible, or, uh, pastors will talk about God having two books. He'll have his book of the Scriptures, okay? his revelation to us, and he'll have his book of providence. Okay? The book of providence, though it is being written on your behalf, it's still a closed book until you go to be with Jesus, right? That'll be open to you. You'll see all the inner workings of God's uh, governing providence eventually when you go to be with Jesus. But as far as discerning things throughout uh, your life, okay, that's something that you got to be very careful for. Now, um, 
And let, let me give you an example of what I'm saying. Maybe it'll help, help you to understand this. Um, does, has anyone ever, I mean, pastors, you probably have this. Have you ever had a, a member of your congregation who's um, talking about a dead loved one, and they say that their dead loved one, before they died, they, pro they said that whenever you see a butterfly flip by your uh, face or wherever you see a, a butterfly land by you, that's me saying hello to you. Uh, from heaven. However, okay, that's happened to me. Okay, and now that person, before I corrected her, was an enthusiast. She had given a divine interpretation that this is what God is doing. Okay, through this butterfly for me. Okay, um, so she was she was looking to she was looking apart from the scriptures about how God was working, what He was doing, and she was giving interpretation to it that she wasn't um, allowed to give. So that's so when we think about little, what we would so let's let's think here. Is everything in your life a providence? Everything that you experience is a providence. Yeah, it is ultimately right. Everything's a providence, and so for you to go and pick out this or that thing as specific providences denies the rest of it. Right? You don't you don't see the rest of it that you didn't uh, pick out yourself. Right? Um, I'll give you another for instance. If you've ever had, I had a member in my former congregation who had a near-death experience. This person was not attending church. Um, and she had been out of the church for a long time. She got in a wreck, a big wreck, big accident. And by the way that the cars hit, she really should have been dead. Um, and she, um, and where was she next Sunday? She hadn't been coming to church. Where was she next Sunday? Church. She was in church, right? Uh, because God told her in the accident that she needed to get back into church. Okay? Um, did God tell her that she needed to get back in church through that accident? No. God had already told her in the Bible <laughs> that she needed to be in church. Okay? That's the thing. It's the, the, that People will do that. They'll try to... Uh, give a meaning to something that God's speaking to them about this or that thing when really God's been telling them very explicitly in the revealed Bible all along what they should have been doing. Uh, okay. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Don't despise God's word. You need the forgiveness of sins every single day of your life. Um, you promised that you would suffer all rather even death that rather than fall away from this faith and make diligent use of the means of grace. Right? There are all these external things from God's word that were already preaching to her this truth. Okay? God be praised that the, God used that accident, sorry, providence, uh, to shake her out of her uh, spiritual apathy. We can thank God for that. But you can't give the interpretation and say, uh, God told me to keep the third commandment through that wreck. Okay? No. So God can use those things, but he's not speaking in clear language to you. Um, so, do you understand what I'm saying? Pastor, are you just look confused? Okay. Or just glaring at me. I, I think it's kind of a fine line between the enthusiasm and is it pointing you back to Scripture? So is it pointing you back to the thing that's been telling you all along? So, like, we have a man who just started coming to our church. We had some event, I can't remember what he said it was, that happened to him. But where it led him was not to some enthusiastic kind of concept. It led him to pick up the Book of Concord, to pick up the Bible, and to start refocusing and then get his butt in church. Yeah. And that's kind of the way he laid it out to me. So even though he talked about this event, he it was where it landed that that was most important. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, go ahead. So I, I'm thinking about some things you said last night and just trying to understand what you're saying. Um, so is it like is it okay to recognize that, like this is God's hand at work versus like trying to like put all the pieces together, you know, and going into God's hidden will versus just simply recognizing, oh, God was doing this thing, you know, for my good. Yeah. And like like. Are you distinguishing between the two things? Yeah, that, that, would be, uh, that would be what I'd be distinguishing from. You're not giving a specific ter interpretation, although with all events, you are saying, yeah, God, God's hand is in this, and he's using it for my good. Absolutely. 
And oh. but then, but not only to recognize that he is, but to see specific ways um, that he's done that. The, I I would say that I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna give you guys a, a fable to help you think about this. Um, but I would say that it becomes much easier to discern providence when there's a final termination in something, particularly the termination in someone's life. Okay? When someone dies and goes to be with Jesus, um, at that point, you really can, I, I think, discern providence more readily, where you can see, because the, here's the thing, as long as that person is still living, okay, let me use another illustration to get at what I'm trying to say. Sorry, everybody. Um, when they were building the Tower of Babel, okay, do you, do you, would you think that as they built that Tower of Babel, all the intelligentsia, all the rich people, all the Silicon Valley people are all gathered together and they're build, building the Tower of Babel, do you think that, that they believe that the gods were on their side? Yes. Do you think that they were that they were thinking God is being so fortunate to us? He's being so fortuitous towards us, so good to us in allowing us to build this. No. Do you, you don't think they were? No, they they said we need to make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered. Okay. Yeah, they're wanting to make a name for themselves, but do you think they were do you think they believed themselves to be being blessed all that time as they were successfully building that? Yeah. Okay. Blessed in some way, whether that was blessed in and of themselves in their own power or if they believed in any sort of other deity. Okay? My guess is that they were saying all along the way to the pinnacle of the building of the Tower of Babel, the God is good. God, I am so glad I'm so powerful and rich to be able to bring this to accomplishment. Okay? Uh, what was God doing that entire time? He was letting them get higher and higher and higher and higher and higher so we could do what? The higher they are, the greater the fall, right? This is what God, this is how God works. He takes the prideful and he abases them, right? It's the Magnificat. Yeah, that's right? what I was thinking. Yeah, go ahead. But the other side of that is Pentecost. Okay. There's where all the languages, everyone heard in their own. So that's the opposite of the Tower of Babel. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we can see so, definite opposites there with, with the Tower of Babel. In the Pentecost for all the languages. Sure. Yes. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that you were saying you're interpreting these providences, right? Or seeing God's hand in things, and things seem like they're going, I suppose, good, or at least according to God's will. But then, what if something absolutely catastrophic happens? Um, you, if something absolutely catastrophic happens, you know, when you die. This is my point. When you die, can anything more ca can anything catastrophic happen to you? No, right? And so you sort of there's no that's where you can sort of see. Oh yeah, God. Look at how God led them to faith, and you can look at those things and you can give God thanks that He used this person to bring them to faith, this person to you know plant the seed, water the seed, etc. You know you can see all those things, and then they died as Christians. You know you can sort of see that. Movement. I think before that point of hard termination, it becomes very hard to do any sort of interpretation, other than to say, I see God's hand in this, and I know it's for my good. Right? Yeah. Go ahead. I think the caution you're saying is, is that we're not meant to look to providence as a source of divine revelation, because, because uh, we... we It'd be so easy for us to deceive ourselves by trying to place our own interpretation on these things. Yeah, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't look to providence for direction or anything like that. Yeah, that's right. Scriptures are for that. Yeah, and so what what happens? That's that's the that's the person who believes in providence so much that they forget about the Bible. Okay? That that's the ditch that I don't want people to fall into, where they become you know suspicious of every little event and try to interpret it or something like that. Yeah, that's the idea. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, everybody. Um, and then the other side, though, is where you have such a strong belief in divine providence and God's direction and uh, governance of, over every little aspect of life that you become essentially, in your belief, a fatalist. 
There is absolute, I know that God's will will be done. And so really there's nothing I can do to change it, thwart it, etc. So I may as well just hands off. What happens, happens. And so the fatal, a person who believes in providence to such an extent, they say, well, if God's will is going to be done anyway, despite me, why even do what? Why try? Why even pray? Why even try and why even pray? Okay. Um, and so if a person, and you know, have you ever had a Christian ask that? If God's will is going to be done no matter what, why should I pray? Have you had a, <coughs> you've at least had that thought, correct? Okay. That's a fine thought to have as an unbeliever, okay? But for a Christian, I, I don't think that that uh, thought, if we're really thinking about what it means to be a Christian, could ever really enter into our mind, okay? I'm not saying that it doesn't, because we're still sinner saint. But what I am saying is that for me to have such a strong recognition of God's power, wisdom, and goodness to me, for me, how could I not run to him over the very smallest things and come to him in prayer. First of all, because God's commanded me to in the scriptures and he's promised to hear me. And I recognize his face as a kind face of a father who wants nothing more than to hear me. Okay? So divine providence is not against a very, very active and simple, humble, childlike prayer life. Okay? I mean, I'm talking about the kind of prayer life when we were on our way here, or before we came here, besides the shoe issue, of God's shoe issue of providence, um, uh, my, one of my little girls was trying to put on Silas's uh, little zipper thing, and the zipper was stuck. Um, and we were just both trying to get it, and I just said, let's pray to God and see if it goes up. Okay? Um, if God didn't answer my prayer or didn't let me zip it up, would I disbelieve him or think less of him? No, because it'd be for my glory, for his glory and my good. Right? But guess what? God answered my prayer and I zipped that thing up, baby. Okay? But I mean that that my that I would that I would think of such a stupid little problem and the first person I want to want to run to is my father in heaven. That's the way the Christian is. Okay, that's, that's a simple childlike faith who, when anything happens, the first person they go to is God, right? You cast all your cares upon God because he cares for you. Um, and you see that in Paul. Paul knows God's providence. He knows his direction, right? Paul says, um, yeah, I need to go to Rome. And Paul has his own intentions about how he's going to get to Rome. And God puts him there and brings him there in chains and is more effective for the sake of the gospel in, fair, in Caesar's household in chains than he ever would have been just going there as a private citizen, right? Yeah. I mean, that's God's providence, okay? He knows God's providence. Paul, at no point in any of his epistles, would do anything like, hey, God's will is going to be done. Don't worry about praying. He'll take care of it, okay? <laughs> uh, no, what kinds of things does he say? Like in Thessalonians right here at the bottom of the page. Pray without ceasing. Okay. In everything, give thanks. Give thanks. And that's, that's a universal right there. In everything. In good, in evil, in cross, trial, boon, whatever it might be. In everything. You pray. And you think about all the other uh, times he just pours his heart out. Um, praying to God for uh, encouraging uh, the same kinds of prayers that he offers up to the Father on the behalf of the church. Okay. So that, those are the two ditches. Don't fall into, uh, first of all, get out of your atheist, a, living like an atheist ditch and acting like things are chance luck, that God's not actively preserving and governing your entire life. Get out of that ditch. But don't fall into the extreme sides of uh, faith, that fatalistic, God's will is going to be done, so why even care about prayer, etc. Or that enthusiast thing of, I'm going to look for meaning not in the Bible, God's clear revelation, but in his hidden will, his uh, you know, cloudy providence, right? You don't want to fall in either of those ditches, okay? So I'm sorry if I made things more cloudy for you in talking about that, but th does that help you at least think about it a little bit? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't have it more thought out. Um, so let's see here. Uh, okay. Oh, let me read you the, the fable. Let me read you this fable, okay? This is how, this is, this is my, the way I think a Christian should act about every event in their life when it comes to providence, okay? So once upon a time, there was an old farmer who had worked his crops for many, many years. 
One day, his horse ran away. Upon hearing his news, his neighbors, neighbors came to visit him. And what are they going to say to him? Such bad luck. <coughs> oh, it's so bad that it happened to you. That's too bad for you. I'm so sorry. They said sympathetically, you must be so sad. We'll see, the farmer replied. The next morning, the horse returned, bringing with it two other wild horses. How wonderful, the neighbors exclaimed. Not only did your horse return, but you received two more. What great fortune you have. We'll see, answered the farmer. The following day, his son tried to ride one of the untamed horses, was thrown, and broke his leg. The neighbors came to offer their sympathy on his misfortune. Now your son can't help with any of your farming, they said. What terrible luck you have. We'll see, replied the farmer, old farmer. The following week, military officials came to the village to conscript, conscript, conscript all young men into the army. Seeing that the son's leg was broken, they passed him by. The neighbors congratulated the farmer on how well things had turned out. Such great news, you must be so happy. The man smiled and said, we'll see. <laughs> so do you get the point? It's where, where someone cuts off the point of interpretation too early, right? They're, they're not taking into what other providence God has in store for them, okay? So it's like, I mean, you just think about this, the idea of causality, right? You know, you were talking about, uh, you know, praying for a parking space. One pulls out, you get in. Oh, God be praised. What a good providence. You know, and then you come back out and your door is all scratched to hell. And, you know, oh, God hates me, right? No, that was a providence too. Congratulations to you. God is working it for your good, brother. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah, right, exactly. And that's, that's another thing, too. We tend to be very uh, yes, self-centered yes, yes. in our idea of that God's... A, my wife rebuked me about this other day. I said, you know, it's really wonderful that God is doing these things uh, in our congregation right now. And she said something along the lines, it's probably not even, probably not even for you or our congregation. It's probably for the benefit of someone else. Right? Quit thinking about yourself. <laughs> she didn't say that. My wife is, honors her husband. Yes. Um, but you get the idea. Go ahead. When you have this quote from Isaiah 8 20, yeah. uh, to the law and to the testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, so the yeah, point is just to head back to the scriptures. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Do, you, do you have in mind here Isaiah 7 14? Uh, so conception, virgin birth? Sure. Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. This is the testimony. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's it's right. Always, I just wanted that. That's, yeah, yeah, that's you take it to the scriptures to Christ. Yeah. yeah. That's a reference to that. Yeah. 740. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Uh, okay. <coughs> Where is this? Where's, oh, that was that was at the top of one demonic of my... Demonic double ditching. It was on the oh. demonic double ditching side, yeah. Okay. Um, Yes, to the Word. The Word will instruct you um, about meaning, uh, the meaning of life and how to do things. Okay? Um, so can we fully understand God's providence on this side of heaven? Answer? No. Okay. Uh, this is on page 24. God's ways are above ours. His ends are higher than our aims. His actions have multiple ends. Uh, his end, God's ends are for His glory. You can look at all that. When you look at... Um, the life of Jacob and Joseph, right? Why did God do all the things he did in Joseph's life? Well, think about all the things that he accomplished through Joseph. He preserved the Egyptian nation, preserved Jacob and his family, laid the foundation for his future designs, brought Jacob to Egypt so that his posterity is left there. Why? So that he could redeem his people from uh, there in the Exodus. And ultimately, could it be so that God... Uh, sent all of them, them there so that Jesus could have safe refuge in, in Egypt that still existed and ruled during that time during Herod's reign. You know? Could that be down the line of causality that God intended? You know, those, those are the things that you see. God accomplishes manifold, far more than we could ever imagine, purposes uh, than we can even think. Okay. Um, any comments or questions before we go on? Okay, go to page 26 real quick. Um, 
one thing I, I want to just mention just briefly, right at the top there on page 26, Jesus Christ, the King of glory and the sovereign reign. Um, what I do want to remind us of, and you already know this, but I want to remind you of, God, Jesus Christ is Lord over everything. He's not just Lord over the church, right? So if you look at the hierarchy, you got Jesus up at the top, and then you've got um, uh, you got the, the you got the church, the state, or you got you got God, you got man, and then he's, God through those means is ruling the church, the state, and the family, right? The three estates. So Jesus right, rules over all. There's not like this distinction between the church and the world as far as Jesus reign. Jesus reigns over both of them. He does them in different ways. There's the kingdom of power and the kingdom of grace. We're not going to get into that. But what I'm saying is that Jesus does indeed reign over all of uh, all of creation, both the state, the family, and the church. Um, so what means does God use to accomplish his ends? Um, you can just look through the list, quite honestly. God uses tons of means to secondary uh, secondary causes to accomplish his ends. Right? We already talked about Esther, where he gave uh, the king some insomnia, right? or some indigestion or heartburn in the night to keep him awake. And so you see just the normal, natural means, insomnia, he uses it to make this big flip. Okay? Um, go to page, so you can just read over that. Go ahead, in your own time. Page 27, divine concurrence and second causes. Um, we've already established this a bit, but I just want to reiterate that everything has at least two causes. God is the primary cause of all things, and then there are also secondary means that God uses. Now I want to deal particularly with sin, okay? Because I just said God causes all things, and so by implication I'd be saying God causes what? Okay. Um, and this is another place, where, this is on page 28. This is another place where you have to uh, go no further than the scriptures go. Okay? Or you're going to fall into having to justify God rather than you needing to be justified by God. So God does indeed order and govern all evil acts by his own unsearchable wisdom and goodness, directing them to the best and holiest ends. And so what we have to hold in tension here are a few things. Look at the biblical teaching there. Okay? Or actually, we'll look at the godless uh, into, uh, teachings right before that. So look at the theodicy propositions. Reason would offer us these only these three explanations to deal with the problem of evil. God is all-powerful, but he's not all-loving. Therefore, evil exists. Right? Because God's not ultimately good, and so he can do evil if he wants to. Um, God is all loving, but not all powerful, therefore evil exists. God would prevent evil if he could, but he's not powerful enough. Okay? Uh, or the other way that we get out of the problem of evil, you just get rid of evil and say that it doesn't exist. Okay? And so you see for the Christian, can the Christian negate any of those realities? Can you negate that God's all powerful? No, you can't negate his omnipotence. Can you negate that he's all knowing? No. Can you negate his all-loving nature? No. Can you negate that evil exists? Okay. So that's where faith and love can ascend to go and worship God, but reason cannot. And so the biblical teaching here um, is that God is not the author of sin. God hates sin. He punishes it. And he puts limits on it. Okay. We, we know from the scriptures, the scriptural revelation is that Satan is the father and author of sin. That's where it came from. And then it's expressed in and through us as well, as fallen creatures. Okay? And so God does concur in evil actions, and this is a very fine distinction that we have to make here. God does concur in evil actions, insofar as what? What, is I, what does it say there? Insofar as they are acts. So insofar as the thing is an act, a actual event within space and time, um, God uh, concurs with it because without 
God's concurrence, it wouldn't even exist, right? Yeah, per remember God's persevering power? If God wasn't upholding it by his will, it wouldn't have happened, okay? He, it, it happened, okay? And so if God was to pull out his persevering power, that wouldn't have even existed. Um, and so we, we can't, we have to say that God does concur in the evil. And so I'll just give you a, a very concrete example that makes you just want to sort of, um, you, ju you just want to sort of crawl, like get into a ball and just weep, right? I, I probably shouldn't even mention anything, but you, can, you all can think of grave, grave, and I'm not belittling evil here. You can all think of grave, grave evils that you have seen done, that have been done to your family, your friends, people you love, outside in the world, whatever it might be, right? Think of the abortionist uh, tearing apart a child in the womb, right? Wicked, wicked, wicked evil that we can't say isn't evil or something like that, okay? Um, insofar as God allows that man to manipulate the tools with his hands, in him we live and move and what? Have our being. That means even evil people live and move and have their being in God. Insofar as those movements happen as acts, God can hurt. Okay? That's, that's as far as reason can go. Right? It can't go any further because otherwise it's going to betray what the scriptures say. Right? It's going to deny the true God. So God does not ever concur in evil actions insofar as they are evil. So, um, uh, pulling a trigger on a gun is not evil, okay? But if it's done by a malicious person with an evil will and it's an evil deed, okay, that, that person who did it is the full participant in the evil. God's not a participant in that evil, okay? Um, so that's the idea. So Acts 17, 28, that's in him we live and move and have our being. God clearly teaches that the thief or the murderer cannot perform his acts without God's concurrence. It states that all men, including the thieves and murderers, live in God, move in God, and have their being in God. It is contrary to the evil person's experience of conscience to think that he is not the one responsible for sin in the act. So this is a really interesting argument, and I'm not going to go deep into it, but I want you to at least consider it. One of the reasons that we as Christians can say for certain, besides the Bible saying that God hates evil and is not tempted by evil. One of the reasons we can absolutely say for certain that God um, is not a participant in evil insofar as it's evil is because when a, a person does something evil, who feels it in their conscience? The person, the person who did it. Okay? The, that, the, the fact that they have a conscience and feel as if they have done wrong, that they have done something that has accused them, okay, is proof that they are the ones who are the only participant in the evil. That's the idea there. It's, a, it's an interesting argument. I don't know if it's very convincing. I'm sort of more and more convinced by it the more I think about it. That if they weren't the moral agent that's performing the evil, their conscience wouldn't be affected. Okay? Um, they would say something like, God made me do it. Okay. No, he didn't. You were the moral evil participant in that. It was your will that exercised the evil. And even, even more than that, to cover up or lie about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's to their guilt. Yes. Their yeah, exactly. Yeah, any, any attempt to justify what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely, that's right. Whatever accuses or excuses them. And so does God permit sin, people? Yes. He does. God does permit men to sin, but that is not all. God also does punish the sin he permitted with further sin, right? God gives sodomites over to their depraved minds, right? He, they start to sin, and he allows them to go even further into it as a judicial punishment. Um, God also places limits on the extent of sin, right? What, you know that quote by Luther, if you had any idea how many arrows Satan had pointed at you at any given moment, right? God limits the amount of evil, and he sets a limit to each individual act. He doesn't let it go any further than he wills. And so ultimately, Satan is the father of sin, um, and man is responsible and culpable for his sin. Okay. Pastor? Yeah, go ahead. I don't look at sin as a list of different things. I look at sin as a condition. Sure. It is a condition of man. Yes. 
Yeah, and so right. the, the original, the sin of original condi the condition, the condition of original sin expresses itself in evil actions, though, right? We, we sin because we are sinners. Sinful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and insofar as those people perform evil acts of mind, of speech, or um, action, God concurs in those only insofar as their actions. The action of the mind, the action of the voice, the action of the hand. Right? He doesn't participate in evil. He hates it. He will punish it. Mm. Um, so, do all, a uh, couple more questions, big questions. Page 29, do all events happen as they do occur, or could they happen otherwise? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, it, uh, based on the scriptural revelation, we have to say that from God's standpoint, everything happens of necessity. Right? Everything that happens must happen. We, here in time, as contingent beings who are dependent upon moving over space and time, we perceive everything as being contingent, as dependent upon circumstance, where somebody is at a certain time, etc. Okay? So our perception as we live out our lives is that Thing, other things are dependent one on another. But ultimately, divine necessity, um, everything does happen of necessity. Okay. And uh, so we, we, can't, we can't go into that mind of God. That's the hiddenness of God that we've been talking about. Okay. Um, and then another interesting question, is the termination of my life subject, subject to change or is it unchangeable? What do you think? It's... it's it, yet again, I think we have to make this distinction between, in the mind of God, it's unchangeable. He's appointed the time that you were born, that you were conceived, born, and you will die. But from our perspective, we do have Bible passages like, look at the middle one there, Isaiah 38. Go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. So it sounds from a earthly perspective in space and time that uh, that the prayer, that God was contingent upon that prayer. He was waiting for that prayer and answered that prayer and granted 15 years of additional life. Whereas God in his foreknowledge and over governing providence, had he already appointed that 15 years later. Yeah. This reminds me of the verse, you know, God created the good works that we should walk in them. Yeah. Right? So yeah. We're, we're the instruments, we're the pieces on the chess board that God is using to play the grand cosmic game of chess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And people get offended when we talk like that. Yeah. So like what Teddy just said is that uh, Teddy imaged uh, God's reign over all creation like uh, us on a chess board and God's going to put us where, where he will, right? Um, that would be offensive if I did not know the God that I have, okay? If I know that Jesus Christ is my God and he's reigning beneficently meet with, for me with his wisdom and power, I'm very happy to be a chess piece in that game, yeah. right? Uh, same thing with like thinking of this life as a stage upon which we act, act out God's already divine necessity. Um, so those are big, big questions. And is your reason satisfied? No. Good. <laughs> I'm not a deist. I never intended to satisfy your mind. Um, you will only find consolation in Christ Jesus. That's the only place. He is where providence and mercy kiss, like I've said. Now, I know I'm probably out of time, Pastor Lair. Should I be out of time? This last question if you, here. If you get, we can take a few more minutes to wrap up. or Okay. All right. I, I don't I don't want to I, I I'm very bad about this. It, it was my it was my sole desire to really be respectful at the time this time. And I'm yet again failing in that capacity. I have a problem with this last is the termination of my life subject to change or unchangeable. Yeah. Are we given a second chance? A second chance? So, I, I, what, what would you mean by second chance? Uh, there are some people who think, you know, the end of the world, there's going to be a peaceful reign, and some of these people will be given a second chance. Oh, yeah, uh, no, like a millennial reign of Christ on earth is a biblical. So, that, that idea of people having an, an additional chance, chance to repent. Yeah, no, that wouldn't be biblical. 
When the end comes, that will be it. There's going to be no millennial reign of Christ on earth. But this isn't an end time Bible study. I'm sorry. Provide <laughs> 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 charts. Yeah, that's right. I have chart. I have weird charts, so it's definitely an end time presentation. All right. Um, so uh, what I've done on the frowning providences uh, section, what I want you to recognize, uh, Luther gives a very uh, harsh quote, but it's a very beautiful quote in, in one way if you understand it biblically. Luther says on page 30 there, the more love one has for his child, the larger the rod. Um, okay. That's, uh, yeah, all of you laugh. Okay, but here's the thing, and uh, I want you to remember this. This is why that sounds, and especially to the child being chastised, um, that sounds absolutely wretched, and I would never want that. And it sort of disturbs us, okay? But you, if, if you start to think that way, what you've done is you've undone everything we've talked about so far. That God exercises everything in all of creation, the good, the bad, the evil, the righteous, everything for your benefit, okay? And so that means if the rod must be larger, that is to be, you, the, the only right response to that is thank you. Thank you that you would take such care with me that you would bring me into eternity like this. That it's, I mean, that's, that's the only answer that a Christian can give. That God loves us so much that he would. Um, and quite honestly, if it comes to my sin and what I need to be chast, what affliction I need to become more in the image of Christ and to be saved, I would gladly receive those, no matter how painful they be. Now, I say that as someone who has suffered very little in my life. Okay, um, probably much. All of you have suffered more than I have in my life, and so that's hard to say. Uh, I say it from, I say it as an abstract theology. You've experienced it, okay? where you could say, "Thank you for the larger rod." Thank you. Right. That's the idea with divine chastening. Um, if God doesn't chasten you, if he doesn't discipline you into holiness and eternal life, um, then you're a bastard. You're, I'm not trying to throw around bad names. That's what it says in the Bible, okay? Uh, but what I'm saying is you're an illegitimate child, and you're not a part of the inheritance, okay? And so it's not a loving thing to not discipline your child, right? It would be... And act, if God did not discipline us, chasten us, it would be an act of hatred of him towards us. Okay. Yes, he would be letting us loose on our own sin. Romans 1. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what I've done for you in this next section, all I've done is I took the headings from this wonderful little booklet. It's called Behind the Frowning Providence. <coughs> um, it's a great little book about suffering. Um, very, very good. It is, it is written by uh, Reformed. Right? So you're going to get like reformed confessions in there. But as far as the truths that they lay out, it's just Bible stuff about how we think about suffering in this life. If God truly is all powerful, uh, all wise, and he's doing everything in my life for my good. Okay? So I just gave you the outline of that. Um, and so look on page 31. We must believe on the bottom of page 31 this. Every work of Christ towards his people carries something more great and precious in the bosom of it than we are capable at that time of understanding. And that's the point. You're not going to understand it. You will not understand all of God's providence in your particular life until you go to be with Him. Um, so that's the idea. Knowing that this is the God that you have, go to page 32. And I'll, try, I'll wrap things up. I have like two more pages after this, I think. Mean. The... For the Christian who is firmly convinced of a providential God who is known only through Christ's love and mercy and that all things will be worked together for his good and for the glory of God, that leads to what I call and what other people have called trustful surrender. That uh, have, have you ever, um, ever walked into a, like a puppy dog? And uh, when it was being naughty or something, and you just sort of walk up to it like this, right? You look at it and sort of glare at it when it's being naughty or something. What does it do? Cowl away. It cowls more. It does what? It flips over 
It just, you know, it's wagging its jangly parts out in front of it, right? Um, so it just flips over and it's just absolute surrender, okay? Um, if, 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 that's, if that's who my God is, this all-powerful, all-wise, uh, loving God in Christ Jesus, then anything that comes into my life, I'm very willing to surrender to, right? Search me, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see me, lead me in the way everlasting. And so that's why I labeled this entire uh, study that we've been doing based on that beautiful hymn that I love, TLH 406. Lord, as thou wilt, deal thou with me. No other wish I cherish. Okay? That's a trustful surrender in God. Do what you will with me because I know what you do with me is going to be good and for my benefit. Um, that, that's, that's what trustful surrender is. And my final slide here, uh, not slide, but piece of paper, 33, is what I call holy abandonment to, to divine providence. And what I mean in this section about holy abandonment is if we know that that providence is preserving us and governing us, no matter what circumstance we encounter in this life, we should be absolutely willing to give up all things for the sake of Christ and for his glory. Um, and I would say that one of the best ways that we can, and I'm not saying that we need to go to some sort of holy war or something like that, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that, um, that if Jesus truly is that gracious king that we hold to be the gracious king, then we want to order everything in our lives according to who that king is. Um, and so that means uh, absolute uh, striving towards knowing God more deeply through his revealed word. And as we know it, come to know it more, being more conformed to it by the power of the Holy Spirit, which he works through the word and sacraments. And then also be, very, be much more willing to speak very clearly and boldly as Christians around everyone you encounter in life. Um, one, of the, one of the wonderful principles uh, that the Bible teaches is that uh, the truth will always edify. The truth will always build people up, even if they don't receive it as building up right away. Right? God will, because it's true and because it's from God, um, what you say will build people up um, for the sake of Christ for the sake of his kingdom. And so I have this Bible verse here. Listen to this. From This is Joab. And you have other men in the Bible saying the same sort of thing. Be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord will do what he, which, that which seem, seemeth good to him. Right? So it's this idea of um, we're going to be courageous, do what we think is best according to God's revealed word. And God will do what he's going to do. Even if our plans don't quite work out as we expect them to, we know that whatever he does is going to be great, right? Even if he tears down our machinations, right? If Luther Classical College, these millions of dollars and countless hours that have been put into uh, building up this college and then moving across the entire country to help start this college and all of this stuff that we're trying to do over there in Wyoming, right? If the Lord puts it down after all of our efforts, what am I supposed to say to that? To God be the glory. Right? God be praised. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the idea. And so I don't want that to happen, right? And I don't think it's going to happen. I have uh, family directly involved in that. All right. Fantastic. What did um, you say? So let's see. Let me just read these last things, okay? I'll be, I'm sorry, everybody. Okay. So let me read this uh, quote by John Flavel. It is the duty of the saints, especially in times of straits, that is hard times, to reflect upon the performance of providence for them in all the states and through all the stages of their lives. And particularly, you want to look at that providence in the Bible. Because where you, how you see God working in the Bible, you can expect that same God who worked in the Bible to be working for you. Um, and just a quote from uh, Gods and Generals, that book. Captain Smith says this, he says, General, how is it that you can keep so serene and stay so utterly insensible with a storm of shells and bullets raining about your head? And Stonewall Jackson says, Captain Smith, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe as in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself with that, but to be always ready whenever it may overtake me. That is the way all men should live, that all men would be equally brave. 
Um, so our courage as Christians is grounded in our belief in the Jesus who I've described to you, the Jesus who is all-encompassing, benevolent, and sovereign over our lives. Um, and just a couple more quotes and a prayer. Firmly believe, this is Matthew Henry, firmly believing that my times are in God's hands, I here submit myself and all my affairs to the ensuing year to the wise and gracious disposal of God's providence. And then John Howe says this, when the records of eternity will be open to us, and all the plans and results of God's profound wisdom are examined, we will make a thrilling discovery. See, this is what God's purpose was in it all. Then we will see the connections and order between all things that it seems so confused and complex when acted out on the stage of time. Uh, and so we are yet waiting for that. And so until then, right down there at the bottom, Deo Valente. God's, uh, the will of God be done, right? God willing. So let's pray, okay? The Lord be with you. Amen. Let us pray. All wise God, thy never failing providence orders every event, sweetens every fear, reveals evil's presence lurking and seeming good, brings real good out of evil, makes unsatisfactory what I set my heart upon, to show me what a short-sighted creature I am and to teach me to live by faith upon thy blessed self. Out of my sorrow at night, give me the name Naphtali, satisfied with favor. Help me to love thee as thy child, and to walk worthy of my heavenly pedigree. Amen. Amen.